started. All right, y'all, let's get this party started, shall we? How are we doing so far? How was that flash panel? Was that helpful? Spend some time with uh, some of the suppliers so that you get a better understanding of what they're doing for you. Um, how about the earlier content? Was that, are you, start, are you, are you getting value from, from all the sessions? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, we're going to announce a website. We're going to try to do an active tech-based feedback loop uh, with a site we've set up. So um, if, since most of you are techie, I'm just going to give you a URL. Just go to it and see if you can figure this thing out. We'll see how techie you are. <laughs> it's uh, frantech.ideascale, S-C-A-L-E, dot com. And it's just a simple way for you to make suggestions on what we use in next year's uh, sessions and for everyone in the crowd to vote for those ideas. So let's see if that works. So let's see how techy our community is. Check that thing out. All right. Um, anybody heard anything about uh, data breaches and issues lately? Is that, has that been any kind of a concern to, by the way, has everybody changed all of their online passwords because of Heartbleed? Have you guys heard about it? You guys know, right? Like every online account you have, you probably should go change your, your passcodes at this point. Um, anyway, obviously, this is happening on a bigger and bigger scale. We've always obviously been interested in securing our systems as franchise brands. Internally, PCI, we've got all these things that are going on. But uh, I think it's pretty obvious we can't ignore what's happening around the world and this acceleration and going after our stuff. This whole big data thing is is becoming a, a, a bigger issue for all of us. So um, the one individual that basically was, was uh, just spectacular last year, according to all of the reviews, was Kevin Johnson from Secure Ideas. So uh, you know, based on the fact that he scored so well last year and that this data breach thing has become even more prominent uh, for all of us, we thought it'd be a good idea to have him come back and kind of revisit with us pick up where he left off and kind of give us uh, the world according to Kevin and secure ideas. So Kevin, if you would come up. Big round of applause for Kevin Johnson. If I have to actually live up to now, right? Thank you. Let's turn this one off. So I hope you guys don't mind. I'm a nerd. I'm going to take this jacket off. Um, I'm amazed it made it this long, right? So thank you very much for coming. Today we're going to talk about loyally exposed and the idea is security is important we'll talk about that today and a lot of people are starting to go down the route if they haven't already been there of building loyalty programs for their customers for their data for their people and then trying to determine what that means sadly most people are trying to determine what it means from a business perspective. I want to talk to you today about what it means from a security perspective because that security perspective is going to affect your business, right? As we see with things like Target, Neiman Marcus, Michaels, all of these different organizations being hacked, the attacks are happening. So before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about me. And I don't want to brag about where I've spoken, where I've taught, the software I've written, because none of that really matters to the effect of what we're talking about today. It's kind of cool, kind of fun. But the biggest thing I want you to understand is that my job is slightly different than most people's. I'm what's called a penetration tester. You also hear me called an ethical hacker or a red team member, right? My job is adversarial. For the people who don't know what a penetration tester is, I'm hired by companies to break in, steal stuff, and then show you how I did it. This is either th through your network, through your web applications, through your clients, your users, all the way down to physically breaking into buildings. Right? I have one of the few jobs not directly hired by FedEx that requires a FedEx uniform. Right? Uh, I actually got to break into an airport using my FedEx uniform. They had no problem. It was bad. They wouldn't let me drive the monorail, though, after I got control of it. 
I don't think that's fair, right? If I have control of the monorail, I should be allowed to drive it. They disagreed something about insurance or something like that. The best part about my FedEx uniform is my latest one that I ordered. I had to buy a new one because I ripped my previous one, jumping a fence. Uh, and in answer to the question everybody has, I've only been shot at twice. <coughs> I will also point out I said at. I've never actually been shot, so that's good. Um, my FedEx uniform, my latest one, was delivered by a UPS, <laughs> right? I thought that was kind of cool, right? I, I'm like, I get the box, like, I knew what it was. This is awesome. So my FedEx guy comes very often because I'm an Amazon Prime addict. And um, I admit my addictions, right? Uh, it's the guy comes in, I get the box, I start laughing. He goes, what's so funny? I said, oh, you got to see what I got. And I open the box and I, I pop it open and there's a FedEx uniform. It's like, whoa, right? And he says, that's a FedEx uniform. I'm like, yeah. And he gets this really, really serious look on his face, right? And he says, they use us to deliver? <laughs> <laughs> no, eBay does. But <laughs> the reason I'm telling you all of this is that my job affects my perspective, right? Like I talk to customers all the time, and the customer will say to me, how's the test going? And I'll say, it's going great. And they'll be like, so we're secure. No, exactly, no. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's going great for me. Uh, would you like the six million credit card numbers back? Just asking, right? <laughs> would you like your social security number back? Because I'm really pissy, I got mine out of your system. Uh, <laughs> just things like that. Uh, so it's, it's the way it works. So it does affect my perspective. It does affect how I answer questions. And I do expect questions, please, today. I am not a stand-up comic. Uh, matter of fact, you'll notice I have a sense of humor, but I won't claim it's good, right? Like one of my favorite current jokes and you knew I was going to say it, right? You guys said don't, but I got to do it. Do you guys know why Walmart wasn't hacked? They weren't a target. But, <laughs> horrible joke I know, but it's mine, right? Um, <coughs> so please don't hesitate. As we're talking about stuff today, as we bring stuff up, please ask questions. If you have something you're wondering, if you've got something you're working on, you know, raise your hand. There's somebody around with a microphone. I honestly don't know who it is. It's that gentleman right there. Uh, he'll run over real quick, and you can ask the question. And I'll try to answer it. If you ask a question I don't know the answer to, I'll make one up. But I'll tell you I made it up. Okay? So that way, at least, if I'm going to lie to you, you'll know I'm lying. Does that work for everybody? Awesome. Okay. So what are we talking about today? Loyally exposed. How many people here have in their wallet a membership card to something, right? You go in and they click it off for every purchase. Ooh, you bought Froyo. The, lo the little, uh, I don't even remember the name of the little franchise out by us that we go to. My daughters love it because they can put all the toppings on that they want onto the yogurt. Uh, I didn't realize that you could get an 87 pound yogurt. Um, but dang it, my Sarah, she, she got us an 87 pound yogurt. Um, every time we buy enough yogurt from these people that we walk in and the owner of the store actually starts grinning. And I don't mean smiling like, hey, no, like grinning like, yes, they're back, right? It's awful. But you know, you check off and you get all this kind of stuff. And we start seeing this more and more and more that organizations are rushing toward these ideas of loyalty programs. If you come in and buy $100 worth of stuff, we'll give you 10% off. If you come in and you buy this, or not even tracking what you're buying to get something, just if you're a member, you get access to these specials, right? And all of these programs, well, they're kind of good. I've never fallen for the idea that they're for my good. I'm well aware of the fact that when a company says to me, if you sign up and you give me data and you let me collect it, I'm doing it for my own benefit. I want to know more about you so that I can provide the right services to you, so that I can advertise to you. Because it's much easier to keep a customer than to gain a new customer. We all know that. That's one of those uh, cliches people say all the time. But cliches become cliches because they're real in many cases. And this one is. 
I know that convincing a company to come back to secure ideas for security services is way easier than for me to convince another company to come talk to us. And yeah, our company slogan gets attention. You know, come on, something like professional evil is always going to get attention, right? And yeah, we speak at things like this, and that works. But that loyal customer is always better because we have a relationship with them. We have contracts with them. We can deal with them easier, and it costs us less money. One of the problems with this is the more loyal a customer is, the bigger the pro program is that we're collecting about them, the bigger problems we have with regards to security. Let's talk about some of the things that we've got, right? You've got, like I said, how many people have cards in their wallet? I don't, I don't think I saw a single hand not go up, right? Everybody has a membership card to something. Even if you've only been there once, I actually find that I go through my wallet periodically to do expense reports for trips, and I'll find loyalty cards for stores I will never go to again, right? I was in Florence, South Carolina, okay? And Florence, South Carolina sounds exactly like it is, right? It's a little town. It's actually bigger than you would think, but that's okay. And, and it, I went into this place there. I don't remember what the name of the, re the, the store was, and they said to me, would you like to become a member? And, and without even thinking, it's like, yeah, thanks. And I took it, and I actually filled out all the information they wanted, right? Because I'm that guy. <laughs> I'll fill out information. You want me to fill out information? I'll fill it out, right? And I filled out all the information. I put the card in my wallet, and like a month later, I'm going through my wallet, and I'm looking at this card. I didn't remember who they were, right? This, I'm obviously a loyalty fail, but... I collect these things and I get them and, and we start, so we see the cards. How many people have seen the new mobile apps, right? How many people here have signed up for the Starbucks app where you can buy your coffee with your cell phone, right? Have you upgraded it in the last week? Good, because you know it exposed your passwords to everybody, right? It gave your password to your Starbucks loyalty program to whoever was on the same wireless network you were on and knew how to capture it. Which meant that if you were on the same wireless network as I was, I could get free coffee, right? And to really scare people when you start talking about wireless, which we're not gonna get into today a lot, but I actually have a little device called a pineapple that if I turn it on, every single person using wireless around me starts talking to my device instead of the regular wireless network without them realizing it, right? It's a mean device, and I'm not here to scare you today. I'm just saying, by the way, I don't have the pineapple with me, so don't worry, because I did see the little thing that said, join the Marriott Conference wireless network, and here's the password. I joined it, it didn't ask me for a password. Huh, we'll see, right? But you have these mobile apps where it's like, hey, I've got this thing. We won't even get into the mobile apps that unlock your hotel room doors. What is that, right? But these mobile apps, Hilton, Marriott, Starbucks, right? So we start seeing all of these different ways that we can collect this data, right? And we have multiple goals. We've already talked a little bit about that, right? We've got, we want to bring in repeat business. If you come back, we'll give you a discount. If you come back, you get a free pint of yogurt or whatever, right? We also start bu building up data. I know that this person who lives in this area, and they answered that quick little survey, so I know how many kids they are. I know whether they're married or not. I know their address, their phone number. I know their birthdays, because part of my loyalty program is I'll wish them a happy birthday and give them a free $10 coupon once a year on their birthday, right? How many people here use those free coupons you get on your birthday? So you do? Cool, I've, I've never met very many people who do. And I don't know why, because they're awesome coupons normally, right? You get free stuff, and I like free stuff. But I know your birthday, which means I probably know what year you were born, because sometimes they ask the year you were born, and people just give that, right? I was born in 1973, no big deal, right? But for me, it's really easy, because I'll tell you, my social security number is 5915236693. 
And yes, I'm well aware this is being recorded, right? I just see people later going, oh my gosh, he didn't know. I knew. <laughs> I don't treat my social security number as private because it's been compromised so many times that there's enough people pretending to be Kevin. But we've got data for marketing because if I know when your birthday is and I know your spouse because they're part of the membership, well, why don't I send them an email the week before your birthday inviting them in to buy you something, right? That's wonderful marketing. Because I'll tell you right now, you invite me to go buy something my wife likes a week before her birthday, I'm going to take you up on that because I am a horrible gift giver. I am. I am the stereotypical guy who goes for Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve. I've gotten better now that I have daughters, right, because they remind me. But having an app, remind me, is wonderful. And so we have marketing opportunities. We also have usage tracking. I know that for everybody I gave this card to at this event, 75% of them came into my store. I know that when I put it in that little, do you guys have Mint magazine out here? I, I know out in Florida we have Mint magazine. It's that little magazine that's, I don't know why they call it a magazine. It doesn't have a single article. It's just coupons to local businesses, right? And I know that when I run an ad in Mint Magazine, I get this many people to sign up for my loyalty program. And if I do this or if I do that, so I start to get information. And as a business person, that type of information collection is wonderful. Because I'll tell you right now, for me, I'm very happy to say that Secure Ideas is profitable, right? We've been in business for almost four years now. We make money. That's good. That's the purpose. We've been able to pay payroll every two weeks without a problem. But I'll also tell you, I have absolutely no idea where my customers come from. I don't. We get them. They keep signing contracts. They keep letting us break in, right? But I honestly don't know how they even found out about me. Now, I have an idea. I have an idea that when I get up on stage, we get more customers. I have an idea that when I get quoted in the CNN, I have customers. I know that when I went in front of Congress about healthcare.gov, we got customers, right? Now, what was funny for me when I testified about healthcare.gov is I got a whole bunch of new customers that thought it was really cool because we were showing those Democrats. And I also got a whole bunch of new customers that knew it was cool because we were showing those Republicans. And I just told both of them, yeah. <laughs> right? Whatever. <laughs> you want to sign? We're good. But having an idea of where people come from, having an idea of what brings them back, having an idea, that's wonderful. Right? Which brings us to this buzzword. How many people here have heard of big data? Do you know what big data is? It's when you use a 45-point font when you enter it. Maybe not. Maybe that's wrong. It's, I, I could be wrong about that. Right? Big data is this buzzword that I get a kick out of because we've done it forever. But now we have a name for it. Right? It was small data before I get I don't know. I, you know. Did anybody ever say, we have small data? Ha ha. No. But there's somebody marketing stuff to you now is big data. The same thing with cloud, right? How many people here have had people approach them and say, you need to move your stuff to the cloud, right? Do you know why we call it the cloud? Because that's the Visio icon for the internet, it was a cloud. And that's all cloud-based services are. They're internet-based, but that's OK, right? The idea of big data is we're collecting information about something our customers, our sales, our whatever. And then we're performing some type of analytics, right? That's it. That's all that big data is from the idea of what the definition is. We'll talk in a second about the concerns, right? As a matter of fact, next slide. Here's the biggest thing you have to remember. If you're collecting this information, you're responsible for it. If you're allowing somebody to collect this information for you, you are responsible for it. 
You know that little comment I made earlier about the Starbucks app, right? And I said, wow, you see your password get disclosed? Do you know who caused that disclosure issue? Can anybody tell me what company was at fault for the disclosure of users' passwords in the Starbucks mobile app? Wrong. They're who were in the headlines. They were the ones who got in trouble for it. They're the ones who had the reputational hit. And yes, I will agree that ultimately, they're responsible for everything done in their name. But they're not the company who wrote the app. They're not the company who planned the app. And they're not the company who caused the issue. But not a single person in this room can tell me who that company was, including myself. Because they were a small consulting firm that somebody hired to build an app. And they got paid, and they left. As a matter of fact, from talking to people I know in the Starbucks uh, organization, and by the way, I want to be very clear, they're not a customer of mine, so I'm not revealing information I shouldn't. But talking to them, they had to go hire a different company to fix the app, because the first company was out of business. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's what I've been told, right? And it sounds good, so I'll share it, right? But they had to go hire another company to fix this app. It's the same thing with Target. Can anybody tell me who was breached in the Target attack? Ultimately, Target, right? But it was actually a heating and air conditioning contractor who was compromised. The people responsible for the heating and cooling at Target stores, they were compromised. And through their connection to Target, supposedly, right? The investigation isn't done. Secret Service hasn't finished, or anything else like that. But the reality is, it was a third party. The same thing happens here. Because I'll tell you right now that in most cases, if you build a loyalty program, in most cases, if you're collecting that data, or even worse, your franchisees are building their own loyalty programs, right, and collecting that data, they're using a third party. There are a number of concerns around this. And, and most of these concerns, I think, make sense. I don't think I have to be a genius to tell you that if you are collecting data about your customers, you have privacy, security, and compliance concerns. I think if that's a surprise to you, you've had your head buried in the sand for way too long, right? But these are the concerns. And when I start looking, how many people here have a Facebook account? Right? How many people here use Facebook for their corporation? Right? Advertising events, things like, oh, you got to talk to this, whatever. How many people here have seen the ad on Facebook that says, three easy steps will build you a loyalty mobile app? Have you seen that ad? Have you clicked it? I did. I actually followed the three steps, right? I built a loyalty program, the Secure Ideas Professionally Evil Loyalty Program. Be evil with us, right? It was kind of fun. You went into this form, and you answered some questions, and you gave them the name, and you gave them some logos, right? And you did all of that, and they gave you an app that you could then publish on the Android store or iTunes, right? And this was kind of cool. And it was free. There wasn't a penny spent on this app, right? I thought, yes. Because I don't know about you, but I'm cheap, right? If I can get something for free, I must be the product, right? And I did something, <coughs> excuse me that most people don't do. I intercepted all the traffic coming out of that mobile app, right? Because that's where my brain goes. To make it a little bit even worse, I had my 11-year-old daughter do it with me, right? Because I'm teaching my daughters how to be hackers. I, I have to teach them the skills, right? And I can't teach them how to fix a car. Well, I can hire a mechanic, but... <laughs> how I fix cars, but I can teach them how to hack, right? My 11-year-old can actually pick locks faster than I can, which is awesome, <laughs> really is. 
Her kindergarten teacher didn't think so. <laughs> it was so sad. We actually got called into a parent-teacher conference about Brenna when she was in kindergarten. By the way, she's now homeschooled. <laughs> they told me that Brenna was having a problem with reality. She was lying. I don't know about you. I don't know. How many of you have dealt with five-year-olds, right? They make crud up. Brenna's best friend for the longest time was Bob the Tomato from VeggieTales. And she would have whole conversations with Bob the Tomato, right? So when the teacher said, come in, your daughter is lying, my wife and I were freaked out. Oh my gosh, this is horrible. We're horrible parents, right? We go in, we have a 45-minute conversation with the teacher about Brenna being a liar. Finally, after 45 minutes, I say to them, I got to ask, what is she lying about, right? And the teacher says, that's the worst thing. I said, what? She goes, oh, on Monday, we asked the students what they did this weekend, and she said, you're not going to believe this. She said she hacked a website this weekend. And I looked at the teacher, and I said, why would you think she was lying? <laughs> that was the wrong answer, by the way. <laughs> the teacher's like, what do you mean? She's five. How could she even know what hacking a website is? So I looked at the teacher and I said, don't you know what I do for a living? She goes, yeah, you fix computers. <laughs> oh, I don't fix them. <laughs> That's when I found out that it's better for the teacher to think your daughter is a liar than a hacker. <laughs> Brenna's homeschooled. But we have privacy, security, and compliance concerns, right? Right off the bat. And I think this is the one that most people understand when it's explained to them. But when they're building the loyalty program, they don't really think about it. How many people here heard about the family that found out that their daughter was pregnant because Target sent her an advertisement for diapers and formula, right? How many people believe the story? Eh, I can believe it. I don't know if it's true, and, and here's why I, Here's the only reason I don't believe it. If I ever found out my daughter was pregnant by Target advertising to me, I wouldn't tell anybody. And in this case, the dad told the news. For that reason, I don't believe it. I believe it's possible. I believe it's more than likely the fact that the father admitted to the world that he didn't know his own daughter was pregnant. I wouldn't tell you, right? But ignoring that part, the reality is possible. We know when a woman becomes pregnant, things happen, right? And I, my wife and I have an agreement. When we have that talk with our daughters, because they're daughters, she has it. <laughs> if we had sons, I would have it, because I don't want to ruin the mystery for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? We know that things happen. We know that we have to buy certain things. And we know that there are certain sales behaviors that happen even before we start to tell people we're expecting. I know that when we were expecting Brenna, right, the little monkey-faced kid who is, and again before when we were expecting Sarah, the little square-headed kid, right, I know that we knew for three months before anybody else knew. Because it's that period of time where you don't tell people because of concerns and things like that, right? When we would just go into being vague. But we already started buying stuff, right? We were excited. We were having children. Oh my gosh, I know. Can you believe people let me raise kids? But my wife offsets me. <laughs> she makes them good. I make them nuts. But we already started buying stuff. Stuff that we ended up not needing at all, right? And I'm sure anybody here who has kids had the same scenario, right? You had a whole bunch of stuff. I, we had more diapers for a brand new baby than any brand new baby would ever need in their entire life if they didn't grow, right? And I'm mean, like, seriously, we had half of a room full of boxes of diapers that Brenna outgrew in a month, right? The local shelter loved us <laughs> because we kept bringing it. It's unused. We didn't know. Like, we didn't know. We had no idea. Right? It was awful. 
when, when she got bigger, there were clothes she had never put on because we had so much stuff. But you get these things. And so privacy starts to become a concern. Are, what do you know about these people? And we always hear people say, well, we anonymize it. No, you don't. You don't anonymize it because you're tracking your own users. And even if you do anonymize, right? I changed your name to an identifier. We have proven over the years that any anonymized data can be de-anonymized, right? We saw that with AOL 20 years ago. They released data. Within a day, people could tell you about the local priest who was looking at inappropriate websites because AOL told them, right? About the teacher who was buying things they shouldn't. The, the policeman who was looking into drugs because the data was de-anonymizable. I don't know if that's a real word, but we'll go with it, right? Because all of that data gets parsed together. And we have to start figuring it out because one of the other concerns is you may not think it's important, but the person at the other end does. A good example of this. How many people here think IP addresses? Your address on the internet, which changes every single time you connect, if for most people at home, right? How many people think your IP address should be private? Italy does, Germany does, France does. Three whole countries. Now, I'm not going to say that their laws make any sense, but they treat IP addresses as private data. I use IP addresses all the time right, without any concern of privacy. How many people here think that email addresses should be private, right? Nobody raised their hand. Yet I bet you that if you go talk to your customers and ask them if their email address should be protected, they would say yes. We just had a debate with one of our customers, right? We did a pen test. We found a way that we could pull email addresses out of their system, right? We thought, meh. It's a finding. You don't want some random idiot on the internet to go be able to grab all the, IP, the email addresses of your users. But we thought low risk. It's not a huge big deal, but it's an issue, right? Our customer, no, it was high. It was critical. It was a business ending finding according to the customer. Why? Because their customers believe that their email address is one of the most private things they should have. The argument we had with our customer, and I say argument like we were yelling and screaming and throwing stuff, but that's not like what it was. But the argument we had with them was, well, yeah, but email addresses are all over the place. Well, yes, but our customers would rather their credit card number be exposed than their email address. Really? Their credit card number? Yeah, because they have zero liability with their credit card. You buy something on their credit card, they call the bank and they say, I didn't buy that, and it's taken off the credit card immediately. You get their email address and you can spam them forever, right? And so their customers felt, and this to me was a disconnect because I never would have thought it was that serious. I do think it's a problem, don't get me wrong, but here's a piece of data that I didn't think was that big a deal. Same thing with socials. I think everybody here can say that social security numbers are sensitive, right? except I told you mine at the beginning of the talk. I don't treat mine as sensitive. You expose my social security number, beh, join the club, right? I run my credit constantly, and really, if you want to steal somebody's identity, somebody who regularly hacks into organizations and steals stuff, it's probably not the identity you want to get, right? That whole revenge idea. Can't wait for my daughters to start dating. I can, but when whoever they bring over comes to the house, and I'll just say, wow, so bad that you failed math. <laughs> Sucks to be you, right? But privacy is a concern. We have to protect this kind of stuff. We have to watch for it, right? And then security. Okay, well, privacy and security, what's the difference? Well, privacy is keeping something private, and security is keeping something unavailable to people who shouldn't see it. Sounds like privacy. There's a little bit more to it. I want to make sure that it's right, right? I want to know that the data I put in there is the data I took out of there, right? I want to know that nobody has modified it. How many people here have looked at the Waze app? 
W-A-Z-E. It's a GPS, right? How many people here use it? It's an awesome app, isn't it? Did you see last week where an attacker found a way that they could have ways start redirecting people because of traffic jams that didn't actually exist? Because we could insert arbitrary data into the Waze app. We could get botnets to report into the Waze app, traffic jam, traffic jam, traffic jam, traffic jam, traffic jam. And all of a sudden, the Waze app would say, wow, we had 20,000 people tell us there was a traffic jam right there. There must be. And people would start rerouting <laughs> through the city. Yeah, isn't that awesome? I like the idea. It's kind of like when I, I bought this treadmill that's internet connected. And it talks to the internet and tells you how far I walked. In one day, I walked 50,000 miles. I'm in shape. But <laughs> it's because the app accepted the data without validation. That's a security issue. When you start talking about your loyalty program, I don't remember which comedian, so I don't want to steal somebody's joke, but I'm going to steal somebody's joke, not credit them, because I don't remember the guy's name. But it was this comedian who his or her idea was that at the end of the show, everybody in the audience was going to go to the local 7-Eleven and buy Slim Jims, right? And he was there one night a week for like three weeks. And his idea was, if he did this for the full three weeks, the next week, that 7-Eleven would have crates of Slim Jims, right? And he would build in this data. Now, he was doing it with an audience. Network now, right? Your loyalty program is connected to the web. It's connected to the network. If I can get in, I'm in. <coughs> and what I have found over the years of dealing with people is that most people don't treat loyalty program data as sensitive. It's just data to them. It's not that big a deal. And it's funny to me because you say it's not important enough to treat it as security uh, sensitive data, yet... You're collecting it for a sensitive reason. It's this disconnect, right? My business wants this loyalty program, but I don't consider it business critical. Well, then why do it? Well, because, right? But it is. It is actually sensitive. And we see this all the time, especially when you start looking at third parties, right? Let's use this loyalty program over here. Let's use this tracker app. Let's use this mobile app that was built for us by this third party, right? We can talk about the third party down in Melbourne, Florida. It is a bait shop and mobile app development store. I'm not making this up. I wish I was. It was a guy who was a UPS driver, and he retired, and he wanted to open a bait shop. And he, I talked to the guy. He read a book on mobile app development. So he thought, I could do that. And so at his bait shop, you could go in and either buy worms or a mobile app for your company. Which I always wanted to know how many extra bugs it came with because it came from a bait shop, but that was a different story, right? I know, bad joke, but seriously, right? And nothing against retired UPS drivers that open bait shops, but was that code the most secure code you could get? Probably not, right? And then, of course, we have compliance. How many people here think about compliance? PCI, is that a scary acronym for most of you, right? Ah, oh, payment card industry. How about HIPAA? How many people here are concerned about HIPAA? Okay, I got a few hands. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have health insurance through your company? Okay. What surprises me is how many extra hands went up. You do realize that if you provide insurance for your employees, you are a HIPAA-covered entity at a certain level, so HIPAA matters to you. Right? But most people don't think about that. Have you thought about the SEC compliance? Have you thought about the fact that the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is now suing people who were breached if they were found to be negligent? Are you in compliance with the government standards for security? Right? And if you're collecting data, your loyalty program, <clears throat> does it ask for information about a kid who's less than 13 years old? And a lot of people go, no. Really, you sure? Don't you ask for family members' information? Didn't you ask for birth dates of the family members? I'll tell you right now, if I filled it out, 
You got two less than 13 year olds, right? And you have to start dealing with that data differently because compliance changes that. So the big question is, so what do we do? It's one thing to say, oh, big data, oh, loyalty program, oh, security, right? But the reality is we have to do something. Because how many of you are willing to turn off all of your data collection about your customers today? Nobody. Exactly. Because your business depends, at least in some way, for that data. So we can't do the ostrich in the sand solution. right? We can't say, no, we're not going to deal with it. We have to deal with it. So we're going to accept it. So in my opinion, there's two big broad ways to fix this problem. And I hope you heard the exclamation points, the quotations, and the italics around fix. Because the sad reality is, is no matter what you do, you can mess up, right? No matter what you do, an attacker with enough time, effort, and intelligence is going to get into your systems. I always love when customers come to me and hire me for a pen test, and they always say to me, kind of uh, conspiratorially, I don't know why we're doing this. You're not going to get in, <laughs> right? Really, I'm not? Every time I hear that, I think, OK, this one will be fun. Because if you're that oblivious to your security holes, it's going to be easy for me. What I always feel bad for is how fast I get in after the person says that to me, right? We've actually gotten into systems and compromised data in less than five minutes. From start to hack, right? Five minutes. That freaks people out. And it's always the people who are like, you're not getting in. Really? You sure? How do you know? Oh, we're secure. How do you know? Because most of you have hired some 16-year-old kid to man a cash register, right? Most of you have some disgruntled employee who's mad for some reason, right? I always love the answer. We have no disgruntled employees. All of our employees are gruntled. Really? I'm not sure that's a real word, but it should be, shouldn't it be? I'm gruntled at work, aren't you? Yeah, I love my job. I have the best job in the world. I get to tell you you suck and leave. But <laughs> policy is the one big way to start the fix. And I want to be very clear here. <coughs> because nobody, nobody likes to write policies. If you, let me ask that, does anybody in the audience like writing policies? Exactly. If you ever meet somebody who raises their hand to that, worry. That person is nuts. They, there should be a medication. I don't know what the medication should be, but if you like policy writing, you should be medicated. There's a problem with you. But policy is how we control everything else. And policy isn't going to fix something, right? No attacker ever said, well, they have a policy that we can't hack them, right? It's like Germany. Did you see that Germany, a few years ago, outlawed the distribution of hacker tools? You weren't allowed to download hacker tools if you were in Germany. Now, I find that funny because they let you use Windows, but <laughs> it's a different story, right? But when you talk to the lawmakers who passed that law, right, their reasoning was, we have a policy that says you can't do it now. And so people won't. Really? How many people here have a policy that says you won't use work stuff for personal reasons? Right? Most of you. Now let me ask you a question. How many people believe that nobody in their organization does personal stuff during the work day? Right? If you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. Because of course people do personal stuff during the work day. My wife is going to call me. My daughter, right now, she spiked to 102 fever this afternoon, right? I used my work phone to talk to her. Now, it's slightly different. I own the company. But, <laughs> right, we're going to do personal stuff. So the policy isn't to stop it. The policy is to provide guidance so that as we do business, as we do the processing that we want, as we build up these loyalty programs, these data collections, and things like that, we know the guidelines of what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. 
these policies <coughs> are the foundation of telling us what we've got. You need to involve your lawyer. I know, lawyers, they're awful. Especially if you start doing business outside the United States, right? Especially if you start doing business outside the United States in California <laughs> or Texas, <laughs> right? Because different states have different laws. Europe has different laws about what you can collect. You need to know what's okay. You also need to know what to do if you have a problem. So you collect all this data. And then some jerk like me breaks in and steals it. Are you required to notify your customers? The answer for most of you is yes. Not all of you necessarily. At last time I checked, it was 36 or 37 states had breach notification laws. And they were all different, right? And which one should you follow? I don't know, ask your lawyer. Only two of my Facebook profiles pretend to be lawyers and you don't want law, legal advice from them at all <laughs> because they're me and I'm a horrible lawyer, right? Is it legal? No. Should we do it? Sure. Wait, no, <laughs> right? But you have to have some type of policy and you should have the policy before you build the system. You should have the policy before you build out the data collection, before you start getting all this information. And if you don't, then you need to build it now. And what you should do is you should look at your current policies about what you collect, right? Because even if you don't have a loyalty program, you collect information about your users. I know that when I go and get my hair cut, they ask me my email address. <coughs> and I tell them, Kevin at secureideas.com. And they pull up the thing and they go, oh, it's been a long time since you got your hair cut. My answer is always like, yeah. I mean, I don't know what to say to that. Are you supposed to apologize? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Like, well, yeah, I'm a little sloppy looking, but I'm funny looking all the time and the haircut's not going to fix that, right? But I'm there. So they collect that data. Do they have a loyalty program? No. But they're still collecting data about me, right? So they probably have policies, I hope, <laughs> as an organization of what they do with that, right? Same thing when I checked into the hotel last night. Oh, Mr. Johnson, how are you doing today? Well, I'm not at home. <laughs> Right? I should answer that question. Oh, well, let's pull your account up, do all this kind of stuff. How do they protect that? Policies are how you determine c protections and stuff like that. But then, after you build the policy, after you build the system, after you start using it, now you have to test it. And testing takes a large number of forms. One, you have to test to make sure it works. Right? Especially if it's a mobile app or something like that. Right? Does it work? Can they get into it? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Yes. Okay, good. You've made it past one hurdle. Right? Now you have to start testing it for security. Does it meet your policies? Does it meet the guidelines of what you're required to do? Right? And so what we do with that is security testing. And there's two different types of security testing. There's vulnerability assessment and there's penetration testing. And it's really simple to understand the difference, other than the fact that they're spelled differently. So seeing them, you should tell they're different. Vulnerability assessment is when I tell you that looks like a security problem. There's a vulnerability there potentially. There's an issue there. Penetration testing is when I tell you not only is there a vulnerability here, but here's the data I got access to because I exploited it, right? That's the difference. Did I attempt to exploit the things I found to validate them? If I did, it's a penetration test. If I didn't, it's a vulnerability assessment. Now, I wanna be clear. You should be performing this type of testing against your systems already. You should. And I know that it's easy for me to stand up here and tell you that you should. And I'd love to sit here and tell you that the only way to do it is to hire somebody like me to do it because I'm a capitalist pig and that's the way I make money. But the reality is you can do it yourself. And to be honest, you probably should, to a certain degree, test yourself. Because it's a waste of money 
just to call up a company like mine and say, hack us. Because if you've never looked at the security of your own systems, and if you know how, and we can show you how, and there's ways to do that, right? We're just going to beat you up. We're going to come in and go, yep, problem, 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 right? You really should be looking at this stuff yourself. <coughs> and as you <laughs> test your systems, the big one that we want you to start looking at is start looking at where you collect this data. If you collect it yourself, that's easier, right? Because it's on your network, on your systems. You have permission to do this type of testing. Don't ever do this testing without permission. Sadly, the hacker community, the security community, seems to idolize people who go out there and randomly hack people and then publicize, oh, look what I did over here. Heartbleed, I think, is a perfect example of this. I can't believe the number of people on Twitter, people I respect, that would post, oh my gosh, I got user passwords from Yahoo. I got this from Bank of America. I got this, and I'm making up names here, right? And the question is, wait, so you hacked that big company, got that data back, and then you published the fact that you hacked them on Twitter? What are you, a moron? But they did, right? But you get permission. Make sure that your management agrees. Helps if you own the company, right? I allow me to hack me. That works. Done. I have permission. Right? But we should be testing our own stuff. Now, here's where it gets a little bit more complex. If you use a third party to host the data or the collection, or hey, we have this cloud provider, we're using Salesforce, we're doing this, right? Are you allowed to test that third party? And the answer is, I don't know. In some cases, the answer is an absolute no, right? If you have a relationship with this vendor, whoever this vendor is, and they have said, no, you're not allowed to test us, don't test them, right? You're breaking the CFA, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, period. But a lot of vendors say yes. They might put limits on it. Like they may say, you can only test the parts of the system that you use, and if you get any other customer of ours data, you're in violation of what you're allowed to do, right? Okay, I can live within those rules. Or they may say, we have a test system over here that you can test. It's not our production system. But it's this test environment that you can perform some security testing in, right? Find out when you negotiate the contract. And if you've already negotiated the contract, go look at the contract. Like, for example, how many people here use Amazon AWS somehow in their business? It's a nice system, isn't it? Do you know you're absolutely allowed to test your stuff on Amazon AWS? They have no problem with it. They have a form you have to fill out. <coughs> Excuse me, you have to give them the IP addresses the tests are coming from, and you have to follow a couple rules. That's it, right? Google, not so much. They don't like people testing them, right? They have a bug bounty program that is public, but it's different than your apps, okay? So you have to know that. Talk to your vendor. My recommendation is if you talk to a vendor and the vendor says, no, you can't test us, this is a surefire sign that you need a new vendor. Because I always want to know, what are you hiding? Why can't I test you? And if they say no and you can't go to a new vendor, have them give you the results of their latest test. Say, OK, I'm not going to test you. But you're having testing done, right? Oh, of course. Nobody ever says no to that. Everybody's like, yes, of course I am. So say, OK, great, give me the results. I'll sign a non-disclosure agreement. I won't tell anybody how bad you suck. But I want to see the results if you've got my customer's data. Because it's not your name that's going to be in the headlines. It's mine. It's not your name that's going to be in the court case. It's mine. Because it's my customer's data I'm trusting to you. Right? And if they come back and say no, jump back to that option of find a new vendor. Right? But more and more vendors will give you. As a matter of fact, when we do pen tests, we give what are called attestation letters, if requested, that they're specifically for giving to a client. 
So our client has a company like you working with them, and you say, give us the results, they have an attestation letter pre-made, ready to go, based on our test. And it says, it doesn't, give you, like, it doesn't give you enough details that you can actually then go do the attacks we did, right? Because <laughs> would you want to tell people how to hack into your stuff? It's like, here's my PIN code, go for it, right? No. <coughs> but it's enough to say, here is what we tested, here is what we found, they did pretty good, or they suck. It's surprising, the ones that say they suck, they never give to people, right? <laughs> But the ones that say they did good, they give out all the time. Yeah, hey, yeah, secure ideas, they hacked us. Well, they didn't, right? Um, but get that information from your vendor so that you know that they're performing regular security tests. Because again, they're holding your stuff. And I can't tell you the number of times we've been able to break into organizations because of third parties, right? We were attacking this uh, airline and they hired us to come in, <coughs> and they were very worried about their booking engine, right? They had hired this company to build them a booking engine, and they were concerned about it. What did we find? We found the entire source code of their booking engine on the internet. Because there was a contest that one of the developers entered, right? And he submitted that code as his entry into the contest. So we downloaded it, because it was public, opened up the tar file, and in it were all the configs, all the usernames and passwords, all of the data for the booking engine. Within a few minutes of starting this test, we had everything with the keys to the kingdom, right? And I'd like to say it's because we're amazing hackers, but in that case, it was because we knew how to go to this really cool website that most people don't know about, Goagle. Um, you go out to Goagle and you search for anything and it'll give you results. It's crazy. And the reason that I know people don't know about this site, Goagle, is because they constantly send me questions that I can answer by going to Goagle. And it, <laughs> right? <coughs> I know my father-in-law doesn't go there, but... <laughs> Because I'm constantly fixing his computer. Um, but that's how we find these things. And it's simple matter of testing your stuff, right? That's it. So the reality is, let's be blunt. Loyalty programs, customer data, tracking, finding all of this information is big business, right? How many people here have seen the geofencing and the iBeacon technology? Where you can actually walk into a store, you have your iPhone in your pocket, and if you walk by one of these iBeacons, your phone beeps and you look at it and it says, hey, did you know there's a 25% off sale on this item, right? How many people here have been to Disney World lately? Did you get one of the bands? Did you get one of the bands? Oh, have you seen the magic band? They're awesome. So the magic band is a, race, a, a bracelet. I'm not sure what a racelet would be, but this is a bracelet. And it's a bracelet you wear that has an RFID token in it, and it connects to Bluetooth networks. And they can track every single place you are in the park. You buy things through it. When you want to buy a, an item, like you know, my daughter wanted the, the um, oh my gosh, I'm blank. my daughter is going to be horrified. I blanked on a princess's name. Oh, man, she's going to hurt me. Rapunzel, the one with the long hair. She wanted one of the Rapunzel dolls. What would you do? You hold your bracelet to the thing. Mickey Mouse's face lights up, charges you automatically, right? All of that data is being collected. All of that data is trackable. All of that data is available for them to know where you go through the park. And we're seeing that type of technology in small mom and pop shops. There's a whole experiment going on in Tennessee where if you walk into a restaurant or a bar or a store, there's a camera up in the corner. It's a blue box. It says Facebook on it. When you walk in, it takes a picture of your face. It matches it with face recognition to your Facebook profile. And if you've signed in to this app, it checks you in at the location, right? So it says, hey, I'm at such and such a restaurant. I'm at such and such a bar, 
Right? You like that idea, right? No. Because <laughs> you do realize even if you haven't signed into that app, it still matches your face against your profile picture. Right? It still knows who you are. You just haven't given it permission to post to your wall. All of this data is being tracked. All of this data is being collected. We have to make sure that while we're not going to be able to stop it, we're not. And to be honest, I don't want to. I like the idea that when I walk into a store, they already know that I prefer sweet tea to that stuff that's just brown water because you didn't put sugar in it when it was hot. Right? I'm from the South. <laughs> I always love when I go to restaurants and they, hey, you have sweet tea? No, we have sugar and tea. Then never mind. <laughs> you don't have sweet tea. Right? Um, <coughs> I like that they know that. I like the fact that apps will say to me, hey, it's almost your birthday. Do you want this? It's almost your wife's birthday. I kind of like being tracked. And I don't buy into the whole, if you don't do anything bad, you don't have anything to worry about. You do, <laughs> right? But we're not going to stop it. So let's do it securely. Let's do it safely. Let's do it politely, at the very least. Make sense? Cool. Any questions, comments, concerns, things to throw? Well, in that case, we're just about done, right? If you have any questions, I'll be hanging around for a little bit, right? Yes? Just, can you get a little bit uh, more specific when you say testing? When I say testing, okay. Um, you should be performing vulnerability scanning. And there is software that you can buy to do that, right? Uh, and I don't want to pimp any specific vendor, but there's things like Nessus and Qualys that you can buy and stand up and do that. Or, of course, you can use a service. Uh, there are a number of vendors out there that provide this. I would be horrified if I did not at least tell you that Secure Ideas does offer that type of scanning, right? How could I not say it? But the reality is all you have to do is stand up this server, run this software, and have it scan your systems. Doing the testing is easy. Understanding the results from the testing takes more work. You have to be able to parse them and understand what they're saying and know what patches are available. And they have a very high false positive rate. What a false positive is, is where the software says to you, oh my gosh, did you see that? Oh, but it's not real, right? And you have to be able to parse that out, okay? And some of these pieces of software come with support that will allow that helping you with that. And of course, if you use a service like uh, Secure Ideas is or, <coughs> excuse me, Secure Works or something like that, their people would rule those false positives out before they give them to you. And this vulnerability scanning, you want to run it on a regular basis. For most organizations, running it once a month is enough because you don't change your systems so often that running it every week is going to give you different results, right? What we tend to do for our customers is we run it monthly unless something changes on the internet that affects that. So for example, yesterday we scanned all of our customers, right? That have given us permission to scan them on a regular basis, right? Because even if it wasn't time for us to scan them, for their normal vulnerability assessment. This was a new flaw, the Heartbleed flaw, that was released. We didn't know about it two days before that, right? So how pissy would you be if I scanned your systems two days ago and then I didn't scan them for a month when this vulnerability was out? I would have been, right? And so you want to start paying attention to stuff like that. So that, that's the type of scanning we talk about. And it sounds, and of course, I should be up here saying it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. You want to hire somebody to do it, right? That's what I should say if I was a good salesperson. Uh, the reality is um, a lot of times you can start doing that yourself and then move into a service as you either grow bigger. One of the things that we... Um, we always recommend in like the franchisor franchisee model is that we like to see the franchisor pushing down policies of this type to the franchisees so that there's standardization across, right? Not necessarily that the franchisor is doing the scanning, 
but that you're actually telling them they need to be doing it. And if you tell them they need to do it, then you probably should be recommending a service for them or building something into their fees or whatever to do it. But the idea being, you're the parent, right? You're the people saying, hey, this is what is right, this is what is good, and helping them come up to the standards you want them to have. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs>